Does the recent GTA 5 controversy prove that we need Anita Sarkeesian's feminism? Actually, yeah, but probably not for the reasons you think. Unless you were living under a rock last week, you probably noticed that GTA 5 was released. Spoiler alert, it grossed close to a billion dollars in a day. And as expected, reviews were extremely positive. Like most critics, GameSpot editor Carolyn Pettit enjoyed the game immensely. But personally, she found certain elements of the game profoundly misogynistic. Perhaps a fair criticism. How do you feel about making this a three-way? And some players loved her reviews so much that they had this to say. What does it know about gaming? And American females are the worst. Brainwashed sheep whoring out to culture smellier than the culture before it. There's even a petition to get her fired. A surprising response, given that she gave the game a 9 out of 10. And such has become the fate of women who've run afoul of the gamer community. Last year, Canadian vlogger and critic Anita Sarkeesian started a Kickstarter project for her YouTube channel, Feminist Frequency. Her thesis was simple. Video games often relied on sexist tropes for their female characters, such as the damsel in distress. Okay, sure. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. But, you know, freedom of speech and all that. And yet, what was the response? Every aspect of her social life was consumed by just the worst harassment. People emailed her photos of video game characters sexually assaulting her. Reddit threads were created accusing her of things like wasting Kickstarter money. Someone even created a game where you could beat her up. Maybe it's just me, but it seems like a bit of an overreaction, right? She was making YouTube videos, not committing war crimes. But clearly Anita and Carolyn struck a vein, and the bleeding would not stop. And amidst all the controversy, we're left with a single question. Why did this happen in the first place? In the 70s, Polish social psychologist Henry Tajafel coined the term in-group favoritism, meaning we tend to favor people who we believe to be part of our group because those groups give us self-esteem and identity. And what constitutes those groups can be pretty loose. Tajival found that grouping people based on a coin toss was enough for in-group favoritism to arise. But what happens when someone from the outside comes along and tells you that something's wrong with you and your group? What would you do? You'd stand up and defend your tribe. Tajifal had a term for that impulse too. It's called outgroup derogation, and it means that you perceive those outside your group as a threat. And that's exactly what Carolyn and Anita are a threat. Why? Because they're women. And to a certain virulent portion of the gaming population, women are never real gamers. They are always outside interlopers, and they need to be shut down. As one Redditor put it, uh, hold on one second, let me <clears throat> put on my Reddit voice. It would be nice if women slash feminists for once f off and created their own thing, rather than moving into a men's space and demanding things change to suit them. And remember, the men's space is the entirety of games. These people are working under the pretense that they're defending the true in-group of gamers, but the facts don't support this at all, not even a little. 45% of all gamers are women. That's right, nearly half. And 46% of the most frequent game purchasers are female. In fact, there's a greater percentage of female gamers over the age of 18 than there are male teenage gamers. And 38% of all Xbox users are women. Links to the sources for these stats are down in the description. So clearly women are not on the outside of the gamer circle. They are very much on the inside. And yet a subset is attacking these women to draw a false line around who can and can't wear the gamer badge. Hmm. This reminds me of something. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Not to be sensationalist, but if we look at history, the Anita Sarkeesian situation isn't that unique. In fact, it might be a sign that things are about to change for women in games. According to sociologist Neil Smelzer, all social and political movements need something called an initiating event. There has to be a spark something to push the issue out into the forefront. And many times that initiating event is marked to a person. Rosa Parks became the symbol of discrimination during the civil rights era. San Francisco city councilor Harvey Milk helped set the gay rights movement on its course. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, sparked the generation's environmental consciousness. And Gloria Steinem's investigations as a Playboy Bunny became required reading for second wave feminists. In all of these cases, these folks weren't the first people to highlight or experience real injustice. But what Parks, Milk, Steinem, and now Sarkeesian did was humanize something very big and made it very small. They gave it a clear voice, a message, and most of all, a face. Injustice is difficult to consider in the abstract. It's just too big. Before feminist frequency, when we talked about sexism in games or in the gaming community, it was difficult to collectively identify who was being harmed. 
But when Anita Sarkeesian publishes a laundry list of horrible things sent to her on Twitter, suddenly we understand what the problem is and who is actually suffering. That's why the New York Times, New Statesman, and Ted all took notice when Sarkeesian became a target. The issue of sexism in games finally had someone, not an avatar as its spokesperson. And that's what all great social movements need, attention from the outside world and a voice to help them humanize the problem. In the civil rights movement, the moment that people from around the world could watch peaceful protesters being sprayed with hoses or attacked by dogs was the moment when the tide started to turn. Obviously, civil rights is a tad more important than video games, but you don't have to agree with Anita's ideas or Carolyn's review to know what's happening to them is wrong. And now people do. A counter petition was started in support of Carolyn, and because of the controversy, millions of people have watched Anita's videos. Now, this should be obvious, but Carolyn and Anita are gamers, and they're also women, just like 45% of all gamers. So do video games need Anita Sarkeesian's feminism? Yeah, because all gamers should be free to talk about games without threat, not just some vocal minority's imaginary definition of who is or isn't a gamer. So do video games need feminism? Hash it out in the comments. And if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Last week we talked about League of Legends and trolls. Let's see what you have to say. Mike G points out that it's not the positive reinforcement that incentivizes people to behave better, but it's actually the investment that you make in your character that prevents you from creating fake you know, Smurf accounts. I think that's a great point. Um, it is part of like a virtuous cycle though, right? Where you put investment into a character and then that's rewarded by the good behavior. So you get more, so you put more investment into it. So I think that the good behavior is a critical piece of why that character is so valuable to you in the first place. Takaga and others have pointed out the many, many ways in which the tribunal doesn't work the way it's supposed to. I think that that's true, but you could say it's the same thing about the criminal justice system, for example. Um, it's obviously a work in progress. We just thought it was really cool to highlight a game maker that was doing something different. Ether Rush points out that it's not trolling that's the issue, it's anonymity. Yeah, I think that that's true, but anonymity expresses itself depending on where it is. So in a place like League of Legends, where anonymity is a problem, but they deal with it in a certain way, versus 4chan, where they don't really deal with it at all, you get very, very different outcomes. So I think the anonymity is a reality of the modern internet, but whether or not people behave badly or well is really up to the people who create those systems in the first place. Heartcraft LTD points us to max pain where trolls are punished by being placed with other trolls. That sounds amazing or terrible or amazing. I don't know. Demers, thank you so much for the kind words. And you're right. You should all pause it for the first frame because I look ridiculous. And to Ken Cruz, I approve this comment.